Hi everybody, Mike Avila here with Sci-Fi Wires Behind the Panel. Uh, I'm coming to you from my Sanctum Centorum as we continue to all be uh, good little soldiers and follow the stay-at-home protocols. Very excited about our guest today. He's the Hugo Award-winning author and co-creator of Kamala Khan. He had a stellar run on Wonder Woman that I really, really wish hadn't ended. He's now on the Sandman Universe title, The Dreaming, and she's also busy with her own, create her own book, The Invisible Kingdom. We are talking, of course, about G. Willow Wilson. Hello. Hi, how are you? Thanks for taking a few minutes out of your day to talk with us. Happy to. You know, you're, you're out in the Pacific Northwest, uh, you're right in the middle of one of the, the major hotspots of this. How, how is the mood there where, where, where you live? How is everybody holding up there? You know, I, I think since the Seattle area saw one of the earliest outbreaks, people here have been preparing, I think, in, in a way that uh, people outside of the hotspots maybe started to do a little bit later. So, um, you know, my kids have been, been out of school now for over three weeks. But I, I think one of the encouraging things about living in the Seattle area is because we have been observing these protocols for like a week or two longer than a lot of other places, we're starting to see that flattened curve a little bit that people are talking about. I mean, you know, like all of us obsessively watch these these numbers and, um, you know, Seattle, like everywhere else, is still getting new cases and, uh, and, and unfortunately deaths, but you're starting to see that, hey, these social distancing measures are paying off. So I think that's the good news is that, you know, like speaking that to you from a news. week in the future, that, uh, that, that it, it does seem to be making a difference, at least here in Seattle. So, you know, like it, it, it does suck to be stuck indoors, but on the other hand, uh, being able to see that, like, yes, this is one of these moments where we all have to pull together and, and think as a community. And if we do that, then we can save lives and, and hopefully get everything back on track. So that's, you know, that's been one small light in a dark time. Well, and well said, because we were talking about it just before we started re re recording, you, you know, with the caveat, right? Yeah, it sucks to be indoors. It could be a lot worse. I wanted to ask you, though, have you made any incredibly regretful or unnecessary online purchases with all this uh, extra time in your hands? You know, thankfully, I've kind of restrained myself. Um, I, you know, fortunately, I, I was already well supplied with technology. I've got my Switch. Uh, you know, like the kids have their tablets. The, the whole limit your screen time and do healthy, you know, outdoor social things has flown out the window. Out the so, window. you know, I've been, I've been playing through Skyrim for like the third or fourth time. It, it, it's it's a weird time. I know we keep saying this, but I, I think for everybody, you you kind of realize who you really are when kind of the supports of that daily routine, that daily structure, and all of those things are kind of taken away, and how you relate to the people in your household when all of those bustling, you know, like errands and school and all of this are kind of gone. So it, it, it's been, I think, a learning experience mm -hmm. uh, as well. You know, your Twitter feed is endlessly fascinating to me because it's this great mix of uh, science, politics, comics, and baking. I'm probably going to get trashed for this online. I had no idea what a Dutch baby was until I came across <laughs> it on your Twitter feed. What is this all about and why has this become a, a phenomenon that is constantly being <laughs> shared across my Twitter feed? You know, I, I, I have to say, you know, like we joke about picking your job in the apocalypse and what would you be doing? And I did not see... Immortan Joe of Apocalypse Desserts on my bingo card, but apparently that's my role now. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think this started because I was, like a lot of people, kind of going through my pantry and being like, what can I cook to stress eat right now? And what I had on hand were kind of like eggs and, and a little bit of milk and some flour. And I was like, oh, it would be really easy to make a Dutch baby because these are basically just kind of very fluffy pancakes that you make by throwing four ingredients in a blender. So they're really easy to do. Uh, you know, you just kind of stick them in the oven for 15 minutes and you have this very fancy looking like pseudo, pseudo souffle type of dessert. And so I made one and I was like, wow, this is really good. That kind of really hits the spot of, of kind of stress baking. And so I joked about it online. And then, a f you know, a few days later, I made another one and I mentioned it and people started sending me theirs. They were like, oh my gosh. And I started retweeting them. And all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, I have to stop retweeting Dutch babies because people are tweeting me like 10 an hour. You're the Gail Simone of Dutch babies. Of Dutch babies. I mean, I'll take it. I'll take it. You know, whatever brings people a little bit of joy. Okay, so we have to talk about comics. So I wanted to ask you, how has the pandemic and the virtual shutdown of everything impacted 
your schedule for the rest of 2020? You know, I, I think I'm probably less impacted than than a lot of people. I, I think, you know, the, the bigger publishers have cash reserves and they have ways of moving things around and they have more moving parts. And so it's it's sort of easier to kind of reschedule on the fly. So I'm I'm kind of one of the lucky ones in that my schedule has not been that massively impacted. There's a couple of smaller projects that are kind of passion projects. I was really looking forward to doing that'll have to be put on hold. But, you know, I'm lucky enough in, in that a lot of the comic book work that I do is, is with Marvel and DC, who are larger companies, uh, you know, who have more wherewithal uh, to, to sort of keep the gears moving, even if it's not clear what the schedule is going to be like. And so my day-to-day -day work has not been impacted that much. The people that, that I really worry about, and I, I think that... Um, you know, we really need to support are the ones who are working in independent publishers, smaller publishers who do not have that kind of leeway for putting projects on hold for months and months. Um, you know, I, I think those smaller publishers, some of whom are doing really dynamic, interesting new work, are sadly going to be the ones who, who, who really feel the impact of this. And, uh, you know, I think that's why it's important now for us to pull together as a community um, and support the people who, who don't have that bandwidth, you know, who don't have that cushion. How does it impact that, uh, your book for, for Dark Horse, Invisible Kingdom? Because they're a little bit larger than the, the, the most independent publishers, but it's a creator-owned book. So has that been impacted at all in the schedule that you have for it? Yeah, I mean, we. I don't think anything is clear yet. I, I assume that, like everything, the schedule is going to end up get, getting pushed back. Um, but I think... One of the most frustrating things for me and for everybody right now is that everybody's kind of working on the fly. There's no real set schedule. Uh, a lot of the questions I think that fans and readers and retailers have are the same questions that uh, you know creators have as well. And the fact of the matter is, is, is that uh, people are getting inventive and, and you know, there have been a lot of different timelines thrown around about when things could start coming out again. But ultimately, it depends on what the long-term prognosis of the country is. Uh, you know, when are we going to see these, um, you know, shelter-in-place orders begin to be relaxed? When are the supply chains going to start up again? Uh, of course, every time some kind of disruption happens in the supply chain, the question of digital gets raised again. How does this play into the digital market? Uh, is there a difference between the digital market and the, uh, you know, the, the traditional comic book market? So... These are questions I think that nobody really has answers to yet, and we're all going to be finding out kind of together what's the timeline like and, uh, you know, what, how is it going to impact different books. So, I, you know, at this point, I don't really have any answers, unfortunately. I've become a fan of digital because it makes traveling a lot lighter, but there's nothing that replaces having a, a floppy and books like Visible Kingdom with the fantastic art in it. That makes your argument for print when you see a book like that. I'm curious what your elevator pitch was to Karen Berger because it is such a great story, but I wonder if, if what the elevator pitch was that made Karen say, ooh, let's do that. I think it was Space Nun Uprising. I think it was, I think it was kind of those three words. <laughs> it was one of those things where I, I kind of had some extra research on hand from The Bird King, which was this, the novel that I published last year set in 15th century Spain. And so I was doing all of this research about medieval monastic life and various different religious orders. And I ended up using maybe 10% of it in the book. So it was kind of one of those scenarios where I'd done all this research and I found these little re religious communities of the late Middle Ages so fascinating. I was like, I want to use this in something, even if I'm not going to use it in this book. And I'd been also chucking around in my brain kind of a space opera centering on a, a crew of people who work for a giant corporation that delivers consumer goods all over the solar system, which bears absolutely no relation to any real life large corporation that might do similar things. So I was like, what if I just sort of mashed these two together and made it a really big epic in which the old ways and the new are very much in conflict. And yet the leadership behind these two organizations that seem to be arch enemies are really kind of in cahoots with each other. 
But I think, you know, the, the thing that really elevates Invisible Kingdom is Christian Ward's art. The guy is really a genius. He goes straight to colors. No kind of inking at all. I mean, he doesn't even really do pencils as such. He'll do layouts and then straight to that color. Right. The art really makes a, a big difference in the visual aesthetic of the book and really gives it uh, an expansiveness. You know, Kirby-esque, I guess. You know, so it's one of the highest yeah. compliments I can play that, pay that book is that, man, it feels just like a movie adapted to a comic. That's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you're enjoying it. I know it's been a blast for Christian and I to work on. How long do you, do you think that story will, can, should run? We planned it for 15 issues and that's kind of what we plan to do. I, I sort of wanted to tell something with a very succinct three act structure. And in comics, 15 issues is a good way to do that. That's three trades of five issues a piece. Um, so, you know, our plan is, is to finish it at 15 issues. Uh, and, uh, you know, when that 15th issue will come out is anybody's guess, <laughs> but that's the plan as of now. You're also writing uh, The Dreaming. First issue is coming out next month? I assume so. Again, nobody really knows what the schedules are going to look like from day to day, but uh, we are still working on it. We are uh, plunging ahead. And uh, I have to say that Nick's art is on a level that just gives me chills even to think about. So I'm, I'm really excited for people to see this book. Is that something that you went and pitched to DC? Because obviously you're a fan of the, the, the Sandman, uh, Neil Gaiman series. Uh, was that something that you, when you heard about the Sandman universe series of titles, that you went to DC to pitch them a project or did they approach you? Uh, no, no, they approached me. I had worked with Chris Conroy, the editor, on Wonder Woman, and he left kind of in the middle to go spearhead the new Sandman universe books. And I really wanted to work with him again. I was so hyped that the Sandman universe was getting another look and that we were going to hear more stories told in that universe. I was a huge goth as a teenager, and so the original Sandman run was was a big part of my sort of personal mythos as a, as a really gothy teen. And uh, so it was after I'd been on Wonder Woman for about a year that Chris was like, hey, we are looking to spin off a couple of the Sandman books. And Cy Spurrier, who'd been doing such an amazing job writing The Dreaming up to that point, really wanted to do the Hellblazer book, which left The Dreaming kind of open. And did I want to, at some point, hop off Wonder Woman and, uh, you know, come to the Sandman office? And I was like, Yes. <laughs> you know, it, I, it probably seems strange to, to make that kind of lateral move to a lot of people who would think, why would you leave Wonder Woman for any other book, literally any other book of any kind? Um, but, you know, as much as I loved Wonder Woman, uh, two books a month plus my own novel plus an indie book plus I was on tour was kind of a lot. And I was looking to kind of clear my plate in 2020 and do fewer things, hopefully better. <laughs> that was, that was my theme for this year. Um, and uh, so it, it, it seemed, that seemed like, okay, this is the sign. This is the sign. Shift down to a book that comes out once a month, focus on doing fewer things in 2020 and uh, kind of take stock. I had no idea that of course, 2020 was going to deal us this unbelievable blow in which everybody is kind of taking stock of their lives in ways that they maybe didn't anticipate. You've talked about this, I think in the, in the, in the essay you wrote uh, talk for the DC Comics blog, you talked about the challenge that a writer faces when they try to add something new to an existing franchise. Wonder Woman's got 80 years of, of backstory mythology built into it, a uh, hugely familiar character. Well, I personally think your run was excellent. It sounded like that was a real challenge for you to, 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 to keep coming up with uh, something that you felt was fresh enough to add to it. How much did that play into the decision to, to, to go from the Wonder Woman office, as you called it, over to the dreaming? You know, that was, that was kind of part of it. I was having a ton of fun on Wonder Woman. Um, and yet at the same time, I, f I felt like, I will, I will admit this to you because we're living in the end times, <laughs> I felt like I really wasn't hitting the high notes. You know, I, I think part of it was I kind of went into it with this feeling of intimidation, this is Wonder Woman. It's really easy to get in your head, I think, when you're handed a really iconic character who's been written by the best minds in the business, drawn by the most brilliant artists in the business, and has been around for 80 years. And you're like, it's not just one pair of big shoes, it's like 50 pairs of big shoes that, that you kind of have to fill. And I, I think I kind of tried to do this very big somber epic you know like gods and monsters 
series when, you know, kind of what I think I do well and what I'm most comfortable in are smaller, quirkier, funnier, more personal stories. You know, and I, I think I could have done done that but I was like I'm gonna prove to myself that I can do like the big somber epic like you know everything is majestic like I'm gonna hit that tone and I, I don't think I really got there and it, it was sort of frustrating to me because I was like I don't feel like this is my best work I feel like it's it's somehow not hitting those high notes and it was it was really yeah I don't know I mean I don't want to willow explain to you willow but I gotta say I, I think you're selling your work a little bit short there so answer me this because I, I think like Tom King is is one person who's probably moving towards this model um, where he, he, him and, and Mitch Garrett, right? They like to work on these maxi series, self-contained stories, somewhat out of continuity. Uh, and, and they can focus on, on making the best 12 issue story possible and then getting out of Dodge and moving on to the next project. Is that more fulfilling for you? And is that something that you'll look to do more of in the future where you do a standalone arcs, whether it's with an established character like a Wonder Woman or whoever, or somebody in Marvel, uh, where you go in, you do a year, year and a half or two on the book, and then you say peace out and I move on. Is that is that a good way for you to maximize your creativity with some of these characters? I think it really depends on the series and on the character. Uh, I, I think you can get into trouble when you don't realize, okay, my tenure on this book needs to be over. I, I think it's it's sort of easy to get to a place where you're kind of spinning your wheels and you don't really realize it. Um and uh, I, I think a good way to do that is to have a set endpoint. But on the other hand, you can also have the opposite reversal of fortune where, you know, like for something like with Ms. Marvel, I had a three issue exit strategy because I assumed that we would get maybe 10 issues, maybe 12. And I ended up writing 60. It really depends. And a lot of it has to do with in monthly comics in any case, um, the readership and are they responding to these characters? Do they love this story? Are they dressing up as, as you know, these people? Am I seeing photos of them at cons? So it, it really kind of depends on a lot of factors. And I, I think that's what makes comics pretty unique as a medium because it is so collaborative and because you are so close to the readership uh, and you, because it is ongoing, it's, it's almost more like writing a TV series. Um, you know, you kind of have to figure out season to season, what's working, what's not working. And I think you can get really, really good storytelling out of that kind of anthology series model where it's like, okay, yeah, we're going to do one season or one set of 12 issues that is going to tell a distinct story. And then we wrap that up and it's done. So that gives you a good sense of pacing where you don't have to worry about stringing it out over two years or three years. You can say, okay, I have uh, an endpoint. And that makes it structurally quite sound because then you know, okay, I know what needs to go here. We're in the second act. I know what needs to happen. Uh, whereas if you have the really long game stories, you kind of have to think about really spooling out that tension and finding little mini arcs within the bigger arcs. So it's, it's a very different way of telling stories. All right, I want to ask you a much more fun question. What are you reading right now? What have you, what have you been reading uh, when you've had some free time away from work and parenting and homeschooling and all that? I've, I've been really reading a lot of the new Sandman universe stuff, loving the new Hellblazer series. It's great to see John Constantine back in action. Nalo Hopkinson series is incredible. I've been doing a lot of going back and rereading a lot of my comfort food books from the before times. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, I kind of went back and reread the first few trades of Transmetropolitan recently. I was like, is this as on point as I remember it? Because it feels like it's just kind of happening right now. It feels like like very much a documentary. You know, my, my eternal comfort food, which anybody who's ever talked to me gets sick of me talking about, is Peter Milligan and Chris Bacallo's Shade the Changing Man from really early Vertigo. I love that series. Whenever I get sad, I go back and read that. But, you know, it, for me, as for a lot of people, this this period of time has been about the things that feel comforting in a time that feels extremely disruptive and there's a lot of upheaval. So, you know, for me, it's, it's been a lot of that. It's been going back to the things that I read, you know, gosh, in my late teens in some cases. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk with us today, Willow. And everyone at home, please make sure to follow her on Twitter for all sorts of baking tips and all sorts of other entertaining uh, <laughs> news bits that she puts on there. Thanks again for taking a, a few minutes of your, your day to talk with us. And best My of luck with everything for the rest of the year. 
Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and good luck to you as well. Take care. My thanks to G. Willow Wilson for joining us today. If you haven't read The Invisible Kingdom, please do so. It is space opera done right. A really, really gorgeous book. And if you want more great comic book videos, just subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget about the Behind the Panel podcast, available from wherever you get your podcasts. And the last plug, don't forget about the weekly column at SciFiWire.com. Stay safe. We'll see you next time. And remember, wash those hands. <laughs>